All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Bart. I'm DevOps engineer for GNOME Foundation, and I split my time between GNOME infrastructure and Cloud Hub. So I'm doing pretty much everything for Cloud Hub, developing the website, reviewing new applications, and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to talk about how Cloud Hub works. Uh, we are developing everything pretty much in the open, so why not talk about infrastructure as well? I think it might be interesting to see um, what it takes to actually run a flat hub uh, on the scale it actually does run. Um, before I begin, um, we have a new website. Uh, if you haven't visited flathub.org yet, please come. Uh, it's newer, it's fancy, it uses all the trendy technologies that people want to use these days. Uh, JavaScript, uh, Mambo Jumbo, whatever you like, uh, it's there, uh, please come. Um, I also want to thank uh, Kolya Lampe for, for his enormous work on all of this. Like, I'm still a, a grumpy sysadmin, and Kolya pushed it all like to, to the point we, we could actually release yesterday. Uh, it, he's amazing. Um, all right, so when you are using Flatpak, this is pretty much all that interests you. Uh, you. You are the user, your Flatpak client hits the CDN, and CDN hits the, uh, the boring servers. And, and yeah, your app is here, right? Uh, in DRID, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but I will show you first how much the CDN does. So this is a screenshot I have taken uh, yesterday at 8 a.m. Uh, and you can see that we are handling just at 8 a.m. 12,000 requests per second. It's all managed by Fastly. And you can see at the global POP traffic that most of it comes at that time from Australia and uh, India. Uh, and obvious, obviously it moves during the day to various countries, which is really amazing to see that people around, there, uh, around the world use, use the flat pack when, when basically they, they get to work or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, these are, I think, mostly uh, monthly statistics. Uh, so uh, every month we are pushing like three petabytes of data to users, which is really enormous. Like uh, we wouldn't manage to do that without CDN. Uh, so yeah, thank you Fastly for donating all of this for free. Um, and yeah, this is the actual architecture of how delivering applications for users work. So when you install an application, it's gonna hit the CDN edge, and if the cache is there, that's, that's basically where the journey ends. Uh, but usually it's not, of course, because uh, we have like 280 apps right now. So from CDN edge, the traffic goes to the CDN shield, which is like another cache layer uh, that is trying to protect us from like uh, sudden, uh, sudden, suddenly growing traffic. Um, from there, it's hitting our own cache because you cannot have enough cache. Uh, there's always another layer uh, where we are trying to, to cache the most used objects. Um, Fast is using uh, something called consistent hashing, so we are effectively doubling the, the storage. Uh, and of course, if one of these servers fail over, it will just automatically move the traffic to the other node. Uh, and if everything fails, it will just keep hitting the repo directly. Uh, and the repo is the single box uh, with uh, fancy ZFS uh, hard disk. So uh, Technically, it was supposed to last for years. In practice, we need to remove all the builds every year because that's how many builds we are getting every, every, every year. And yeah, from CDN Edge, we also get uh, logs about requests uh, to our log server, which is later used to process statistics. Uh, we are not collecting any, any like personal information. It's just flat pack version and CPU architecture. So for example, we cannot tell which distribution has just enabled flat hub by default. It's always kind of interesting detective work you need to do to learn that, uh, for example, endless OS enables flat hub by default. Um, you, you just kind of need to correlate whatever is on Foronix or, or other Linux news website with, with the spike in the graph. Otherwise, you just you know, go blind. Um, yeah, so this is about the delivering, delivering the application to the user. Um, a lot of cache, uh, but somehow it actually works. Uh, as far as the builds go, uh, if, if you are maintaining an app on Flathub, you probably know about BuildBot. So every time you open a pull request or push a new commit to GitHub, it submits a webhook event to BuildBot which then tries to figure out whether this, this, this is actually a legit webhook coming from the, from the Flathub organization 
uh, figures out which architectures are, are available for a given app, uh, and then communicate with uh, four uh, builders which uh, were donated by Equinix Metal, uh, two for uh, x86 and two for ARM64. Um, and yeah, this hits the flat manager, which is our Rust project for, for managing uh, O3 repositories. I'll get back there. Uh, and some uh, people can upload builds directly to Flat Manager, which is kind of our uh, goal uh, in the future. So basically you just are bypassing entire GitHub. So if you are a GitHub hater, you could host your app elsewhere. Uh, or mm, basically there are like two reasons for that. So uh, with all Electron apps, Rust apps and whatever, uh, the expectation is that you get network access during the build, uh, which we don't offer on our infrastructure. Uh, and the other is that uh, for trusted vendors like Free Desktop SDK, which takes like, uh, I guess, two weeks to build uh, without the cache, uh, we just don't want to see this on our infrastructure in the first place. Uh, so yeah, BuildBot first validates the manifest with Flatpak Builder Lint, which is a, a new project uh, I wrote in, in a few days to make sure that uh, manifests are sane. Uh, the problem with Flatpak Builder Manifest is that you can do pretty much anything, and uh, given that I'm one of the two primary reviewers of new applications, it doesn't scale. Uh, so the linter is supposed to kind of replace me. Uh, in the future, we also want to extend this to actually validate the build, so make sure that uh, Let's say you don't include development headers when you don't need them, uh, stuff like this. Uh, then BuildBot builds the app for requested architectures. Um, it's magic, I don't exactly know how it works, like, uh, but it works. Uh, for, for building applications, we are using org.flatpak.builder flatpak app. Uh, so if you are trying to reproduce some build failure, I recommend uh, using this instead of your distro package flatpak builder. Mostly because I'm not a good open source citizen and I don't add shim patches when I don't like something that Flatpak Builder or Flatpak does. So, so it behaves slightly different, especially once as far as the validation goes. Uh, especially about upstream. Uh, upstream is very interesting specification. Uh, that, that could be another talk, I guess. Uh, so yeah, BuildBot also tries to check that upstream icon desk desktop files there. Flathub is primarily desktop focused. Uh, while we do allow CLI apps, uh, that the experience is not exactly great. So we need to make sure that the desktop file uh, and metadata that will be later used on the website is also there. Uh, and yeah, uh, for historical reasons, we are flashing the publishing queue every three hours. Um, I don't think there's a good reason now, these days, uh, for, for the delay. Uh, what I'm trying to sell when people ask is that you can basically test your final build and plug it out if you want to remove it before it gets published to the users. Uh, but I think that's something that we will revisit in the future. Uh, for the flat manager, uh, as I said, it's a, a API written in Rust for managing repositories. So uh, all three repositories are, are a little bit brittle. Uh, you cannot do two publishing at once, you cannot import too many objects at once because everything will break. So Flat Manager makes sure that there is a single type of job running every, every time. And of course it also solves the problem with uh, getting external people access to, to upload anything. Um, apart from that, it also gener generates uh, deltas. So instead of da downloading 2000 files, you download a single uh, batch file uh, with all the objects that have changed between the versions, uh, or just entire delta, it's called from scratch delta, which contains all the objects. So despite claims of HTTP2 being faster for, for multiple files, it's really not like a uh, single file always downloads faster than, than multiple files, even if you have a single counter for that. Uh, Flat Manager these days also ma modifies the upstream verification data. So on the new website, we have the ver verification feature. Uh, if you are a developer, you can log in and verify your, uh, that you own the ID by either the website or uh, GitHub uh, slash GitLab account. Uh, so we also want this to be in the future visible in the native frontends like uh, KD Discover and GNOME software. And so this is why we need to modify the XML to make sure that this metadata is there. 
Uh, and yeah, afterwards, assuming that all of this works, uh, we are notifying the CDN to, to purge the summary file, which is like the, the index file with what is where uh, as far as the apps go, uh, and the backend to, to update the data. Yeah, and the website. Website is, uh, is fancy, I would say. So Next.js frontend. Uh, it, it's, uh, I guess, not so cool these days uh, as far as JavaScript goes because there is a new framework every other week. Uh, but what it gives us is that we are pretty much serving the static data most of the time. So this way, the, the, the front end hits the back end uh, only once and then caches the data before it changes uh, instead of just hitting the back end for every request. Uh, the back end is written in Python. Um, it's a little bit of messy. Uh, it, it hasn't aged well, I guess, uh, maybe because I'm the main developer. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's trying. So basically it talks to Flatpak API and it tries to read the summary file, the upstream file, uh, and kind of make it nice uh, into, into the things in the website. Um, reproducible data is stored in Redis, uh, which is known uh, as the best uh, database for persistent data. It totally doesn't keep everything in memory and just drops it when, when you disable it. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, this is why this is about reproducible data. We can just reload everything when, when something goes wrong. Uh, and yeah, and persistent data is stored in PostgreSQL. Um, so at this point, it's just the verification. And um, yeah, and the payments in the future, I guess. Like, the payments code is already there. It, it's just not enabled on the website. Uh, totally not because uh, people post a uh, beta domain on, on various social media and then complain that beta website is broken. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's pretty much the overview. Uh, as I said, everything is developed in the open. So if you have any questions or, or ideas how to make things better, please join us on one of these channels or, or this course. Um, yeah, we are always open to, to contributions. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. That, that, that was a short one. There was a question there. Uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that uh, direct uh, publishing is something that uh, you you want to expand basically in the future? Yeah, in a way, yeah. Uh, let me get back. Yeah, so let, let's say that's the current yeah, flow. Exactly. So, um, do you have a plan uh, regarding uh, tokens and their lifetime and their management in some kind of, uh, let's call it, a, a system that? Uh, uh, isn't bottlenecked by, uh, by, by me, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, for the context, for example, uh, Mozilla has a reminder in their calendar to contact me a month before their token expires to make sure that they can still publish new versions to, to Flash Hub. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely, like, uh, I don't scale, as I mentioned. Uh, I need to be removed from the picture because otherwise Flash Hub will suddenly disappear when, when I'm gone. Um, which actually always happened when I take vacation. Like <laughs> there's always an infrastructure problem when I don't have my laptop with me. Uh, yeah, uh, in the future, uh, that will be kind of embedded into the new website. So uh, we want to reverse the flow a little bit. Uh, you will log in with some account, uh, GitHub, GitLab, whatever, on, on our website. Then you will be able to verify the ID even without uploading anything. And that will give you the token. Uh, we are using JWT tokens right now, which, which is not ideal. Uh, like, it's completely not the intended use for the JWT tokens. Uh, so we need to, good question, what we need to do. Uh, I guess we need to have a lot of duct tape uh, to make sure that this 
this works well. But basically, you will be able to, to have a, a token generated from the UI. Uh, and we should have reminders, like automatic ones, that, that the token is able to expire. Uh, the other thing that is going to change, uh, I didn't mention, uh, Peelbot works, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's not great, basically. It's, it's like Jenkins, but somehow worse. Um, I, I mean, it's completely out of touch with, with what is going on with the CI systems right now. It's completely unlike GitLab CI or, or GitHub Actions, which, which is strong and uh, yeah, we basically need to get rid of all of it. So, so the idea is that we, we will move all CI checks to Flat Manager because currently whoever gets the token gets to upload anything without, without any additional questions. So the idea in the future is that when you upload uh, directly to Flat Manager, uh, if something is wrong, uh, it will raise the flag for the manual review. Uh, and of course, we need to make the CI much, much more thorough. Great, and um, will this also work for uh, free data service decay? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions? I mean, you haven't talked it in this talk, so I don't know if it's on topic or not, but uh, there's this thing that creates pull requests, uh, the external data checker, right? Yeah. Uh, you say you wanna remove billbot, kind of, like would that be affected at all or just be the same? Like it's well, the, we, we, the we request will be created and then instead of billbot, something else would run or? Yeah, we will need to sort this out. So what I was thinking about is like a middleman API uh, so, like, we need to replace Billbot completely, but we still need to keep the automation tool for pull request running. Like, we have about 2,000 repositories. Most of the builds are hosted by us, uh, so so we cannot just remove it and tell people to go elsewhere. Uh, so, with some sort of middleman API, we will be able to still get webhook events for new pull requests and start a new build and post a comment that that something has been uh, built or not. Uh, and yeah, external of this data checker is, is also very important. Uh, like we need definitely more examples also for that. We, we want to make the usage more popular across applications because, uh, I mean, you know best as a KDE app maintainer how much work it takes to, to keep everything up to date. So uh, we definitely want to make uh, developers' lives easier. Uh, we just need to kind of get the priorities right. <laughs> more questions? So when you say that um, the plan is to eventually uh, retire BuildBot, does that mean, that does that imply that FlatHub generally won't be doing any builds by itself? No, no. Uh, or it's just a bot? It's just a bot. We will okay. just replace it somehow. So. Uh, I mean, because the team is small and we, we don't have like infinite resources, uh, I think the good idea would be to have this, this middleman API talk to GitHub Actions, for example, and then trigger new builds on GitHub Actions, but still use runners we are managing ourselves. Uh, so, so this is basically the, the long-term idea. We will somehow make this work with some external CI system, but still running actual builds on our own infrastructure for, for safety reasons. Uh, well, and performance reasons as well, because what you get for free is usually slow. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, comments? I'm gonna count to three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's thank Bart for the talk, thank you. Thank you.